Hello everyone, welcome to our webinar today, Lead Instructors During Class. Today's webinar is brought to you by State Farm and Safe Kids. Today's objectives, we're going to be talking about the responsibilities of the lead instructor during class, also talking about the logistics of completing the course, and discuss the environment for students that are created by the teaching team and also explain the importance of classroom management for a successful class. So today, again, we have returning to our webinar series on instructors, our presenter, Alan Buchanan, who is from North Carolina and is a certified child passenger safety instructor and a former CPS board, <clears throat> excuse me, chairperson and also was the 2017 2017 CPS Instructor of the Year. So, Alan, welcome, and uh, let's begin. Thank you, Kim. It is great to be back um, with you all today um, and talk about all the exciting things that go on during a class. You know, to have a successful class, there are lots of moving parts, and you may not think about what you do, but there's a lot that has to come together to have a successful class. So let's talk about a lead. And this is this quick definition of lead. I actually like the Wikipedia definition a lot better, um, simply because um, a lead actually has the ability to lead a guide. And this is a very unique skill that one has to have to be able to lead a group of people or individuals. And you know, not everybody has that quality. So if you're a lead instructor, thank you for all you do because you do quite a lot during the class. So during the course of a during the course, a lead instructor of course has a lot to do. And there are seven items on your screen now, but the last two at the bottom, the oversee and supervise, is really the nuts and bolts of what we do. And you know, it's almost like we're a manager in a lot of ways. You think about the manager of a department store, um, that's kind of what we do. Uh, you're not a boss, but you have to really oversee and see, supervise a lot of moving parts. So definitely um, it takes a great amount of skill to be able to do that. So the lead defined by Safe Kids actually says that you have the ultimate responsibility for every aspect of the course. And this is just a quick reminder. You know, unfortunately, as a lead instructor, a lot falls on our shoulders and we have to be prepared for a lot of different things. So, you know, doing your homework and staying up to date is key. Uh, we'll talk about some of the things, but one of the things that I think is essential for a lead instructor is staying up to date on those policies and procedures. And they are kind of your guide to a successful class. And again, if you haven't reviewed those policies and procedures, which are updated routinely, please review them and take the time to remind your instructor teams when you're doing classes about PNP. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that can come up and if you refer to policies and procedures, it will get you through those tough situations without any problem. So be sure to check those out, the links on your screen for that. So these are all during the class. We have to motivate. And that is tough. We're not only motivating the students, but we're motivating our instructor team as well. You know, it's easy to lose um, our, both our team and other, um, other students. You know, lectures get long, days get tiring, there's a lot that goes on. So when we start losing um, our, our students that are not as engaged, we actually have to do something to get them re-engaged and back in the class, back in that learning spirit. So from the start of the class, I always think it's important when students arrive to welcome them to the class. So when they arrive to the training, be prepared to give them, you know, with open arms to welcome them to the class. To, you know, it kind of gives them that first um, perspective of what to expect. You know, um, so as they arrive, you know, be, be sure you have a greeter. You know, just put yourself in their shoes. Imagine walking into the class for the first time. You're getting ready to take your first CPS class, and you notice all these training aids sitting around, all these car seats, and you never touched a car seat before in your life. It can be very overwhelming. So that's what we have to do as instructors, put ourselves in the, their shoes. You know, 
relieve that anxiety of all possible. Now, I can see a student walk in, they're frazzled from the start. They didn't know how to find the class. You know, they came in, nobody greeted them, gave them any information. If they start frazzled, they're going to stay that way for a lot of class. So you can relieve that anxiety with just a simple greeting. Um, you know, avoid ignoring the students, make them feel welcome. And a good way to do this, because as a lead instructor, we have a lot going on already. We're usually dotting our I's and crossing our T's still, and trying to make sure everything, problem solve different number of things. Is maybe when you do your instructor meeting, assign an official greeter, give somebody that task. And if you have a course assistant or a technician assistant helping with class, they like um, tasks to do or things to be part of the class. And that's an easy thing to do. That's a great way to get them involved. And plus, it's great for the students as they arrive to be welcome. So just keep that in mind. And then, of course, one of the first things we want to do as they arrive is make sure our roster is correct. And, you know, this is a great time to verify the course roster from the start. Um, again, that course assistant can take the roster around. And I like to actually have the students initial the roster to verify their attendance. Uh, it just confirms they're on the official roster before we start. I also like to get them to check the roster, um, check their information. And that's a great time. Um, a lot of times they may not register themselves. Somebody else may do the registration process for them. So we can actually show them how to make changes to the profile if necessary or where to go to find that information. So they get there early enough, you know, utilize your time to talk them through that. And then sometimes I usually have a daily log of, for the students to initial, just to keep for accurate attendance. And I think that's important, something to have to be able to fall back on, especially if a student says they were in the class or goes back to report to the supervisors that they were in class and they actually were not there. You actually have some verification documentation that you can give. So the lead is really responsible um, for a lot. And that roster is very important. So as a lead, you know, you want to make sure only those students who are registered for the class attend the class. So if they're not on the official roster, unfortunately, they don't have a seat in the class. And the reason for this is we want to make sure our instructor team can give those students who are actually registered and paid to be there, all the attention they deserve. And unfortunately, if we have extra people, um, even if they want to monitor the class, it's really not allowed. And we really don't need any extras in the class because it takes away our attention from them. Uh, the other little quick note, oftentimes I'm sure you get asked, can current technicians attend the class for CEUs uh, for recertification? Unfortunately, this is they are not, this class is or the technician class is not eligible for CEUs. Um, that's more for update refreshers or other opportunities, and there's a lot of opportunities out there now to get those continuing education units. So, also doing a class, some of the lead responsibilities, and that's quite a few. Is you know we already talked about making sure that course roster is accurate, and I like to start make sure that's done. Um, by the end of the first day. Uh, we don't want that hanging over our heads if at all possible. Uh, you want to make sure you monitor the, um, the course to make sure you're adhering to all the policies and procedures. And as you know, there's a lot of moving pieces going on. Um, you may have lecture and somebody setting up for hands-on or activities. That's a lot to do to make sure all those um, policies and procedures are followed. As a lead, you really should be present for the entire course. Um, that way you can, you know, it's not a good policy to be leaving the course midday. Um, you're really responsible to the course, so please make sure you're, if you're taking on the role of lead, that you can actually, you know, be, in, be present for that course unless an emergency happens. In case of emergency, I think it's a good idea to have um, somebody else who's, um, you know, actually lead approved to be part of your instructor team. That way, in case you cannot dedicate yourself to the class, you actually have somebody to fall back on who can take over that lead instructor role. So something to think about. And if you don't have another lead instructor in your area, now's the time to start mentoring somebody to take that role. So maybe your next class, you find that person who's ready to move into that role to start mentoring them. 
Um, and of course, we have to teach the class. Uh, we all know that. And of course, you didn't have additional grading responsibilities um, that come along. And of course, making special accommodations for students uh, whenever necessary. So on that first day of class, I think there's a lot that a lead has to do. And you know, you have to really make sure all these things are attended to. And most importantly, if we say we're going to start at 8 o'clock, I like to start at class 8 o'clock. I think there's nothing worse than having students arrive on time and just sit in the seats for extra 30 minutes to an hour. So make sure you start on time. I, you know, it starts the class off to a great start and, you know, really sets the momentum for the class. We well, already covered the roster um, and greeting the students. Marking students' absence who are no-show. Uh, in the last webinar, we talked about when to mark students absent and when not. Um, of course, you know, that is something you may want to review if you're not sure uh, when to use that absent box. And of course, by the end of the day, you want to be thinking about students who need the extra assistance. Not the students who are going to fail, those who may actually need some little assistance or extra guiding. Uh, they may need to test read to them or the quizzes or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, that's part of our job is actually identify those students so that we can work with them a little bit further and help them along if at all necessary. So when you start the class, um, right from module one, uh, you lay the foundation and it's um, set the tone for the class. And I, as the lead, like to do this module. And hopefully if you if you're the lead for classes, you're considered presenting this module. And the reason is, I think it's important for the lead to review the course requirements and expectations and give very clear, concise um, direction. Um, it's very important for them students to understand from the start of the class the expectations. And that way they can't come, if you have somebody else present the module, they can't come up and say, well, they didn't know. You as a lead know you covered that material and you know you kind of dodge your eyes and cross your t's from that point so in the first module it actually goes through the training program completion requirements and i think it's very important when you do module one to take a few minutes to explain these thoroughly when i present this i really emphasize the participation part and this is a great way to engage your students is emphasize it's not just enough to come to class, you have to participate in the class discussion and activities. And that's one of the things as an instructor team, I like to tell them that we're, we're actually paying attention to. If they think they're required to participate, then they don't know any difference. So you're more likely to have them engage in activities and discussions as needed. And also the checkup event, they really need to be there to participate that in well, as well and not just um, sitting on the sidelines. So as far as the curriculum content, when you're actually doing a class, there are no changes allowed to the PowerPoint. And remember that. Uh, you can't make any additions, no extra videos, no alterations. Um, everything has to stay the same. Um, but what you can do is you can always add more hands-on or practice time. And of course, that's what the students usually ask for, is they always ask for that you know, extra time to practice if at all possible. So please stick to the curriculum um, as written. Also, when the instructors are presenting the material, you want to make sure that they actually don't stray from the curriculum itself. So as a lead instructor, as that manager, I know it's tough, but sometimes we have to oversee things and we really have to bring that assistant instructor back in and make sure they stick to the curriculum. And that may just mean you know, asking to take a break or call time just long enough to, you know, get them back on track. Um, it's very important to stick to the curriculum so that we don't confuse the students. Um, worst case scenario, you as a lead may have to be prepared to take over if, you know, for some reason you've had a problem with this instructor staying to the curriculum as uh, written. So another problem we face sometimes is we like to tell stories. And unfortunately, the longer we stay in this field, the more stories we have. And stories are great for updates or technician meetings, but they're really confusing to students when they, you know, are um, our technician candidates. 
Um, so try to avoid the number of stories that you have. And if you do use a story to get to a point, or if your instructor team does, make sure it's really quick. We don't want to spend too much time on the story that we take away from the key concepts. And oftentimes we see that happen. So again, sometimes you may have to handle those situations when instructors deviate from the curriculum itself. You know, I love hearing all the great things that um, my instructor team does in the field, but the classroom really uh, isn't the place for that. So consider having a monitor for each module to make sure that they stick to material as written. So when your instructor team is teaching, when you do that instructor meeting, I like to challenge my team. And I challenge them to come in and present the material in a new, exciting, engaging format. Now, anybody can read the slides, but can you give the material or deliver the material so you engage your students? So, you know, find a creative, creative and exciting manner to deliver that material if all possible. Engage our students. You know, there are some great modules to be able to do this. Module four, for instance, teaching the vehicles. Then go back in and use the slides just to kind of reinforce what you taught. Module seven, maybe a great idea is to print out labels of the parts. And as you go through the parts, have the students label the parts on the seat as you go through them. You're putting the hands on the seats and they're actually learning as you go through, you know, the different parts. And it's a great way to get them out of the seats and involved in the class. And then module nine, you know, if you're working with um, three or four other instructors, maybe you divide the class in small groups. As you present the material or the instructor presents the material, maybe have small groups where instructors with that group, as you go through the information, they are actually working the groups to practice harnessing and the parts of the seats and moving the harnesses and putting the doll in the seat, those types of things. And it really engages them. So it really reinforces what you're actually teaching in front of the class and it kind of breaks up the monotony of the sitting in your seat taking notes. So, you know, delivering the material can be easy, but then comes the grading part. And of course, we have to evaluate several different things in the course. Make sure that your instructor team understands what you're evaluating, especially on the hands-on assessments. Please make sure that everybody's on the same page um, so there's no discrepancy when you actually get to those situations. But along with the hands-on comes the written exam. And it's very important that you follow the actual procedures for the written exam or the course policies. Um, when I do the written exam, and on the next slide, you'll actually see that it kind of goes to some tips there. Um, you know, use, use ink when grading. It's, um, I don't like to see your instructor use pencil. Ink kind of, you know, a different color, even if it's purple or green. Sometimes I had, once I had a student told me that red is actually intimidating. Um, or, you know, green color, even though the, or purple, or whatever the case may be, even though the answer is wrong, it's not as intimidating to see to them that, you know, as a red mark would be on the paper. Um, but you as the lead instructor, you're, over, you're responsible for overseeing all quiz grading. And you may want to take this on yourself just to make sure there's no discrepancies. But under no circumstance should anybody change a grade or, you know, answer once the test is actually submitted. So always follow those administration guidelines. Provide reasonable accommodations if necessary. Uh, make sure you maintain an acceptable test environment. And I know on the last day of class, we all, we're all ready to go. That is not the time to be packing up our classroom. It, you may be trying to be quiet as a mouse, but it can be disrupting or disturbing to a student when they're taking the test. And when you actually review the test, a couple of quick tips is one, don't allow your students to have pens or, paper, pens or pencils in their hands. Uh, you don't want them writing down the answers for future, um, you know, um, people taking the class. The other thing is, make sure people are not using their cell phones to take photographs of the answer sheets or tests. And, you know, we'd like to think it doesn't happen, but everybody's very tech savvy. So, you know, before you pass the test and answer sheets out for review, this makes you sure you have a uh, secure environment. And finally, that I think one of the worst things a lead has to do is deliver bad news. 
when you have to deliver that bad news, as tough as it may be, um, you know, they may not, they missed over the limit. Make sure you have somebody there with you as a witness, um, just to back up what you actually told that student, just in case something comes up later. So the guidelines for quizzes, um, you know, make sure you follow the specific guidelines. Um, you know, don't allow any student to change their answer once submitted. Don't share the quiz and definitely don't alter the quizzes or assessments anyway. So oftentimes we are, you know, students may need special accommodations and we need to make sure that we actually are able to meet these uh, needs if, you know, when, when requested. Uh, one of those special accommodations may actually be um, reading the quiz to them. Whoever you assign reading the quiz, please make sure they read the quiz in one voice and not, um, you know, use different tones for answers and that sort of thing. So um, just make sure you're, you know, you're ready for those requests when they come up. If they come up, as far as record keeping, it's very important that you, you know, you make a note of whatever special accommodations that you may need to do um, for that student. So. I usually, you know, somebody requests um, some type of special accommodation. I usually like to keep down the file with the rest of the files for my class. Some quick examples of special accommodations, of course, is that reading room. Uh, maybe they need a quiet space for the test, uh, taking the test, and of course, maybe they need a space so that you can actually read the test to them. If you have a situation where you think, you know, you you gave quiz one already and you've had multiple students miss a lot. Maybe that's a good indicator, indicator that a lot of students may benefit from having the test read to them. So consider the reading to everyone. Make that main room your reading room. That way it's less embarrassing for those who have to actually leave to have the test read to them. And those who do not want to take advantage of the test read will actually go have to go to another space. That kind of alleviates some of that embarrassing moments that can happen uh, with those situations. So as far as skills evaluation, uh, this makes sure you administer, follow the administration guidelines for skills evaluations. Always maintain a proper testing environment um, and give clear, concise instructions before letting the students go out for the evaluation. Uh, please follow the rules and make sure your instructors uh, understand the um, scenarios that you have to avoid in confusion. So one thing I've learned as a quick tip for skills evaluation is always give uh, or state a clear end time. If students think they, think they have an unlimited amount of time to complete something, they will take advantage of it. So if you're doing skills too, you know, maybe you state your end time depending on the number of students you have. We have two hours to complete this uh, evaluation. And that way, it kind of eliminates that one student who has every scenario to do when everybody else is finished. Everybody tends to stay more on task. Um, so make sure you stay the clear end time uh, to kind of aid with that. So special accommodations for skills um, evaluations may come up. So upon request that the individuals are physically unable to install a car seat, um, they should be permitted to verbally guide an instructor with the correct installation. And of course, this will be the same um, apply to those who are recertifying, who may need to actually get their seat checks verified. Uh, they should actually be allowed to do the same thing. So they're physically a challenge. It's actually tougher, but they should give, be able to give clear, concise uh, explanations for what they actually want you to do. Please, you know, work with your team to make sure they're not doing it for them, but they should tell you step by step what should be done. Um, but those special accommodations should be made. So for instructor candidates, it's often asked um, about lead ser serve as a mentor. And I really recommend that the lead does not serve as a mentor um, in the same course for an instructor candidate. Try to have somebody else be the mentor for that uh, instructor candidate so that they get the full attention they need uh, from the mentor. The lead already has a lot of responsibilities going on. Um, so with that in mind, we try to avoid you know, dual roles. So as far as instructor candidates, um, they're not really limited to one mentor. 
when I have instructor candidates, I like to designate one specific mentor for them to actually go to. It kind of alleviates any confusion. So everybody should funnel their information or feedback through that one mentor. So their mentor is giving clear, concise information to their instructor candidate. Because they're already stressed, you know, it's a stressful thing, um, situation to go to during your um, candidacy. So we want to make sure they have a rewarding experience at all possible. Uh, so make sure, you know, just make sure they have one assigned mentor, if at all possible. But, you know, it's nothing wrong with having more. I just have like to have that one point of contact, if at all possible. So as far as classroom management, which is really a lot of what we do, and we really have to manage both our instructor team and student. And as a lead, a classroom management is really essential to a quality class. If we keep our classroom um, to uh, a great learning environment, the students will probably learn a little bit better. We want to avoid that horse playing or cutting up or anything that can be deemed as distracting to our students so that they can have um, an accessible experience. So one situation sometimes you may face, uh, say for instance, in the back of the classroom, you have a instructor table for your instructor team to set up, set at. What do you do when that becomes a problem? Unfortunately, we have to step up with those situations and be ready to remedy the problem. So, you know, you may have to ask yourself if the instructor table really needed. And you may have to take it away, especially if you're sitting right on the right on top of the students in the back of the classroom. Um, you know, we want to spread those instructors out, you know. Make sure they engage with the students. This is not the time for them to be catching up what, uh, what each of you know each of the members of the team did the night before. So you know, just keep that in mind. Sometimes we have to take care of those tough situations. So some other quick situations, just real quickly. You know, whether you have an assistant instructor or a member of your instructor team who constantly interjects and interrupts the lecture. Again, as a lead, as a lead you have to handle these situations especially if you see the, um, the instructor in front of the room becoming frustrated by the constant interjections and interruptions. So, you know, you may have to actually um, ask your team to avoid this at all possible, plus it usually extends the time of your lectures. Uh, if you have a student who is not engaged, uh, give the student a role. Um, you know, maybe call, up, call on them to demonstrate in front of the classroom or do, you know, be the lead on some activities or the leader of a group. Um, find a way to engage that student, whatever the case may be. If you have an instructor who gives them correct information, try not to embarrass them in front of the classroom. You know, give them a chance to make the correction. Usually I'll um, take a break and actually give them the correct information so that they can go back and make cor that correction itself. And finally, a student who may not be following testing procedures, by all means, be careful uh, about accusing somebody of cheating. Um, you know, I usually try to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation or maybe the next quiz use multiple versions to eliminate that or maybe sign somebody to just monitor them, be more present so you can avoid that talking, doing skills evaluations. So it's a lot to manage, but a good lead does that great. So I think this is a great time to start with questions. And we have one right off the bat. And that was uh, guidance for successfully completing skills evaluation three. Um, oftentimes, I'm told um, it's very confusing how to administer skills evaluation number three. So the first thing is understanding what skills three is actually asking. And I think if you look at the guidance or the actual uh, skills evaluation sheet, you know it's very. You, you'll see that it's very clear that it's asking for correct restraint use. Uh, is it facing the correct direction, correct harness use for that direction, and then seat belt, lower anchors, and tether use correctly. So a couple quick tips. Um, you know, of course, one has to be a booster seat scenario. Try to keep your misuses real world and to keep key concepts. And of course, um, you know, don't make them too difficult. Uh, maybe you have an instructor who didn't set up the actual scenarios or a course assistant or IC. Uh, go through the scenario, see if they can find what's wrong before you actually have the students do the skills evaluation. Uh, if it's too hard for them, it may be too hard for the students as well. Um, 
but you know i definitely do not make mine so hard that's you know it's impossible them to find uh, what the misuse is and with that said i'll turn it over to kim okay carrie do we have any questions that we can have uh, ellen help us with Yes, and actually I'm very excited that Amanda asked this one. She said, we have a breastfeeding mom that would like to wear her three-month-old child during the course. How would you handle this? Do you allow it? How do you ensure she gets the most out of the class as well as the rest of the participants? Yeah, um, so yes, you can allow it. Um, you know, that's a special accommodation, definitely. <laughs> um, hopefully, well, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, I was, I was going to say, um, I can I can answer a little bit more fully when you're done if you'd like. Oh, go ahead. Yep. <laughs> I kind of heard that in your voice. So here's here's the thing. We all know that the class is a lot of inside, a lot of outside. It's a lot of getting into cars and getting out of cars. And my first concern is for a safe environment for that three month old. Let alone the fact that it might be distracting to other students. We want to make sure that you know mom and child are safe. And I'm a little bit concerned about, about the, just the, the technical situations of getting in and out of cars. Um, also, we know that the class really runs, it's, got, it's a well-run machine. And so um, part of the, the problem or part of the concerns about if you have uh, moms that want to breast pump or breastfeed is that they have to take care of that at certain intervals. And they say things like it'll take 10 minutes, but it, you know, it does take a little bit longer. So it can be very distracting. If you allow something like this, you really have to pay attention to the physical environment, but also really pay attention to your agenda and your roster. It might be that it's not really the best time and that they should wait until um, they are no longer breastfeeding, again, for the safety of the child and also for the class, because you do have to stop the class because they have to attend the entire time. Do you have anything to add? <laughs> Sorry, I just jumped right I in. But <laughs> you agree with the safety, especially to bring the child to class, and you definitely want them don't want them in a situation where they may drop the child or you know cause injury to the child. So it's a lot of things to consider there, and also may put the rest of the classroom at an um, uncomfortable situation. Mm -hmm. So lots not to, to mention on. weather. You know, we know that we're out there. You know, rain or shine or cold, and you know it's fine for us to bundle up, but when you've got a little one as well, it can be a little bit of a challenge. So um, please consider very carefully if that's something that you are able to handle. I do want to say that you are under no obligation to accommodate every request that, that makes, it to your, um, makes it to your ears. You do your best with what you've got, but there are some things that we just cannot handle. Okay, so we have a question from Amy. She says, what's a good way to handle an instructor who jumps ahead in the curriculum? Jumps ahead, so I assume that they mean, uh, she means going um, too far in advance. So for instance, module seven is a, a place where you can actually jump ahead real easily if you fall in that pitfall, so to speak. So it may be, to, you know, you just have to take a quick break to bring them back in, or, you know, even just walk up there and whisper something or hold up a sign in the back of the classroom. But, you know, module seven is one of the modules where you can almost teach module eight and nine <laughs> real easily if you uh, are not careful. So, uh, you know, hopefully your instructor is open to suggestions and um, understand that you're just trying to keep everything on track at that point. You know you know, another thing, Alan, is that these are great things to talk about in your pre-course meeting. You know, as a group, how are you going to handle somebody jumping ahead? What kind of signal will you provide if somebody's, um, you know, getting off topic or telling a story? So those mandatory pre-course meetings are not just about logistics, as you would know if you <laughs> listen to Alan's um, other webinar, but that's a really great time to tackle this as well. Um, here's another question. Is it okay to fail somebody for a skills test if they run out of time? Uh, yes, I think there's a reasonable amount of time for everybody to complete, especially when you have, um, you know, everybody in the class complete and they haven't done uh, a couple of scenarios. Um, there's a lot amount of time to complete that. Um, in my opinion, it is. Um, unfortunately, they just did not fail, uh, they failed to meet the requirements for that skill evaluation. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now we have another question from Kim. 
What's the difference between a technician assistant and a course assistant? So a technician assistant could be just an experienced technician from your community who is just um, just wants to help. And this is a great way to them actually attribute, you know, contribute to class. Um, they may be a great value as far as um, moving um, equipment or just helping out in the background. A course assistant um, is probably a person who is working towards becoming an instructor and is actually the first step to become an instructor. Um, of course, they have to complete that course assistant requirement before moving on to the instructor candidacy. Great. Anybody have any more questions? Lay them on. Okay, Kim, I will turn it back over to you. Very good. And those were all excellent questions. And Alan, uh, thank you so much for your time and preparation. As always, you provide some really uh, great tips. And I hope this is going to be inspiring to some of you folks out there that are new instructors and uh, need to have something to follow. And these guidelines are terrific. So thank you so much. Uh, any parting words, Alan? No, just thank you for this opportunity. Uh, it's amazing how much we do. And when you start putting together a presentation like this, it all com it really comes together how much work it is into a class. But you know, I know everybody does great things and it's very exciting to be able to teach classes. Very good, thank you so much.